Hi there. Um, I'm Glasgow Phillips, and uh, these are the stars of the panel. We're, 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 we all work in animation in, in various different ways, and so uh, I'm going to introduce everybody, let them uh, talk a little bit about their favorite projects, maybe show some work, and then we'll see if we can get in an argument about something. Yeah. Um, Food fight. <laughs> Food fight. <Yeah>. Sounds good. <laughs> um, sitting closest to me is uh, is Dave Valmos, who is a co-founder of Six Point Harness Studios. Um, they work mainly in Flash, uh, and uh, he'll be showing us some some very cool stuff from an upcoming feature uh, feature film that he can tell us a little bit more about when he gets to. Um, next along is John Andrews, who is a uh, senior VP at Klasky Shupo who uh, produces Phosphor Kachu, which is their spot, spot producing division, is that correct? Um, and they, that's a legendary animation house, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, and so he can tell us some about the work that he's done. Next we have Antron Manugian, uh, who is our representative here from, uh, and the president of the International Animated Film Society, ASIFA Hollywood. And we're gonna talk with Antron a, about, a little bit about some of the benefits of belonging to an organization that allows us to network and get to know one another. Um, the next gentleman down is Patrick Verone, um, known by many as the president of the WGAW and the leader of our strike um, against the vile corporate titans. Um, also a very talented animation writer who is now entering into uh, a, a fascinating and from a business perspective exciting uh, new production deal with uh, Machinima.com. And so he'll talk to us a little bit about Machinima, what it is, in case there's anybody who isn't familiar with it, um, and maybe some some emerging possibilities for creative people to find new ways to do business. Um, uh, next down the road, we have Aaron Simpson, uh, who runs Cold Hard Flash, which is a the premier uh, aggregator of information about about flash animation, um, and so he's going to show us some really cool stuff that I just saw for the first la first time last night. Um, it's amazing what Flash, which for a long time we I at least thought of as this kind of puppety two dimensional uh, type of technology, is allowing for some really fluid and interesting stuff now. Um, and all the way down the end there, we have Jorge Gutierrez. Uh, and we will look at a little bit of his show El Tigre, and he's presently embarking on. Uh, the writing and directing of an indie animated feature, which is, uh, I mean, to me, any of the indie stuff is always interesting to see. So uh, he mentioned, uh, or he mentioned uh, Coraline and Nine as, as interesting projects, and so maybe we'll talk some more about that kind of stuff. Um, so Dave, you want to say some more stuff about yourself while I get this uh, media moved over here? Sure. Um, I am part of Six Point Harness Studios that was founded uh, about six years ago. We took our core group who had been working on an animated feature film in Flash at the time and started a little studio. We've grown, uh, shrank, grown again, uh, and right now we're doing work on a DVD feature for Comedy Central for the show Drawn Together. Drawn Together was canceled, but they're resurrecting it uh, through a DVD feature because it has a very strong uh, audience audience that they think will buy a lot of DVDs. Um, my involvement at the studio is both as an artist and on the business side of things, which uh, can make for some very long days. But uh, we have a all digital pipeline that is paperless, uh, which is fairly unusual at this time for 2D animation. Um, I would like to say it's ecologically correct, but you know, one doesn't know how we're going to eventually discard the Cintiq monitors that we work on. So, um, but we we don't chop down trees to do draw our drawings. We draw them all uh, digitally on in software. Um, we we really have focused on television animation, and the first DVD project we're doing is a slight departure from what we usually do, but uh, it's it's hopefully gonna enable us to do a lot more longer form stuff, including hopefully eventually our own our own feature. 
You want to go and roll a little bit? Yes. All right. This is a clip uh, from the work in progress. You guys can't talk about it after you leave here. It's very top secret. Close your eyes. the sound sound quite that bad before uh, our, you, you know I guess the sound designer gets fired now but uh, that, that is a work in progress and uh, it is it, it is the prequel uh, when which takes place in a bedrock like community okay. <laughs> all right that, that, I thought it looked good um, thanks Dave um, what did you think from a writing point of view <laughs> All right. For our next one, um, we're gonna we're gonna load up some some media from Paul Cummings and I hope that I hope I said this right, Tony Fiandaka. Uh, eh. Fiandaka. All right, we're in the neighborhood. Um, Tony Fiandaka, who uh, I presume our director representative could yeah. mm -hmm. Um Would you like us to tell give sure. us a little lead in while sure. that load her up? Yeah, I. Uh, I came to Class Chupo in 1998 uh, to um, oversee a commercial division, which for the last uh, nine years has been called Kachu, which uh, somehow relates to Klasky and Chupo, you know, enough to have made a funny word out of it. Uh, and uh, basically my job was to um, uh, cultivate a, uh, a directing roster uh, to represent for commercial work and uh, broadcast titles. Uh, and uh, kind of what I've done, tried to do over the years is make that a virtual kind of animation festival of, uh, of, um, of unique uh, directors with unique styles that uh, uh, might appeal to the ad agency's ever fickle taste. And uh, it's an, been an evolving uh, roster, although there's been, uh, there's a number of people that have been there uh, with me for, you know, the neighborhood of a decade. And um, uh, today what I'm going to show is a little different uh, uh, from uh, what you're going to see from the rest of the people who are showing animation, in, in that it's uh, animation created by shooting uh, people, live action uh, people, uh, human beings, uh, in a frame-by-frame -frame manner. Uh, sometimes we call it pixelation, sometimes we call it uh, uh, stop motion. It's a little bit like uh, shooting humans Gumby style. Uh, and then uh, in our post-production facility, which uh, is, you know, is both kind of classic uh, post-production gear plus Maya and After Effects and uh, various other things uh, you'll see in some of these spots uh, that we've uh, taken what looks like a very kind of DIY style of uh, shooting and uh, added some digital effects to it. Uh, um, uh, there's a Red Vines commercial on here, I think you might get a kick out of it. The, uh, the, 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 the point will be to try to discern when you're looking at practical Red Vines animating or when you're looking at uh, computer uh, generated uh, Red Vines. But um, uh, basically uh, my job at Klasky Chupo has been really interesting over the years in that uh, it's been sort of outside of their core business of doing uh, the kids shows and more in uh, developing web content, developing um, webisodes for advertisers and, uh, and, and working with an array of uh, directors. So uh, here, I just thought uh, these guys are hot right now. They did a, uh, they did a short three or four years ago that um, uh, recently uh, went over five million hits on um, YouTube. It's called Tony versus Paul. And um, that's basically kind of what got them going at, uh, as, a, as a team that uh, I just happened to see their short and sign them. And uh, I've had four campaigns with them this year. And I'm going to show you four spots uh, that represent those campaigns. Here we go. No dialogue. Costumes of this commercial, each one is worn for two frames. If I'm feeling retro, I go for a classic. The dollar menu, always the great taste I want, always a great price. And this dude, no, I'm not that guy just yet. Really 
lose interest in eating them after you've animated them all day. The world could use a little more red vines. Take red vines with it, don't worry. Presenting the new generation commercial. As you can this see, this is actually shot live and animated by uh, David Benoist and Stan over in uh, Six Point Harness. Choose your favorite frame and take a picture together with your friends that resembles this as much as possible. That way, we'll get from this to this. You'll be able to see the final result in a month right here on TV. Good luck. Generation, official sponsor of Friendship. Proximus, so much, so close, together with Balbicon. Thanks. to talk about that technique and uh, whether it looks like something that's just so easy, but I'm sure there's a, a little bit of work involved. Uh, yeah, there's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's actually amazing how quickly you can shoot a 30 second spot uh, in this manner. And we've shot at everything from, you know, consumer, uh, you know, uh, to uh, consumer video to uh, red cam uh, HD. Uh, and, uh, you know, the nice thing is, that, oh, and by the way, the way these guys sh uh, shoot is not, um, uh, shooting stills, it's actually shooting uh, live footage and then taking frames out of it, uh, you know, because it gives you the latitude of choosing, kind of choosing the best frame for each uh, for each shot. So we shoot bursts rather than shooting uh, single or, or, or single single frames or two frames. Cool. Um, okay, Antron. Uh, Antron is not showing us any media. He's telling us about it. What's going on? What's up with the CIFA? Well, the thing about Entertainment, animation, I guess, in particular, is it's a fairly small community. And as such, it's really important for one who's, whether you're trying to break into the business or are a part of working professionally, it's, it's really important to interact with your, with your peers and colleagues. And I think that's probably one of the main benefits of an organization like the Sea Bollywood because it gives people that opportunity, whether it's attending an event or a screening or a gathering, it, it gives people an excuse to get together. I mean, hopefully a panel discussion such as this will offer you some good information, but take a look around at the people who are sitting in this room. You never know, that, that gentleman sitting to your right might be the next person that you do something with. And more often than not, that tends to be the case. So it's, it's important for people who are working in this business to take advantage of opportunities like that and join organizations like the CIFA Hollywood. There, there are other great groups as well that are, such as Women in Animation or Visual Effects Society as, as an example, again, that are a bit more specialized, but those types of groups are really good to be a part of so that you can kind of broaden your, your horizon with respects to people and, and what talents are out there. And you just never, as I said, you just never know who you might run into. And if you're into animation, the best thing to do is to go where animation is. Go to, go to events, go to programs, go, go where, where animation folks go. So ASIFA Hollywood, as I said, is a really good organization among other things, to foster that type of thing. The, uh, we also do the annual annual awards, which, which are the animation awards that we've been doing for the last 36 years. We have an archive in Burbank, which is a wonderful resource of art, as well as cartoons and, and other material, as well as uh, reference material. So it's, it, it's a good group to, to be a part of. And, Anybody's interested in joining or want more information about it, you know, see me after the panel. I'm happy to tell you more about it. Thank you. Is that archive open to the public? Can you just go check yes. it out? Yes. Uh, Tuesday through Saturdays, 1 to 9 p.m. It's uh, 
it's, it's a digital archive. So although there is physical material there, most of the collection is, is on the computer. So I think we currently we have over, over 3,000 cartoons that have been digital, digitized and over 10,000 uh, still images of various sorts. So it's a wonderful resource. Come check it out if you haven't. Thanks. Um, Patrick Barone, it, uh, we, we're going to show some classic now. Now cla the machinima has been happening long enough for there to be classic machinima. Um, and we were going to show some, but we're having a hard time with our internet connection. But uh, can we have a show of hands of who's familiar with the concept? Okay, so we're pretty much familiar with the concept, but, but Patrick, maybe you speak a little yeah. bit more about it and uh, about what you're doing. And for the rest of you who don't know what machinima is, I will perform it in mine. Um, but before I do that, let me talk about myself. I've, I've been a, a, a writer for about 23 years, because I started when I was five. And uh, I worked on uh, The Tonight Show and Johnny Carson was there, and then I got into animation about 15 years ago, shows like uh, Rugrats, The Classy Shupo, uh, The Critic, Pinky and the Brain, uh, The Simpsons. I spent most of uh, my time over the last 10 years on, on Futurama and the Futurama movies and I created uh, the Class of 3000 for Cartoon Network. Um, for the last four years as president of the WGAW, uh, my, among the challenges foisted upon me was the uh, negotiation of our contract last year, which, which as many of you uh, probably know, was about new media, uh, both the reuse of the classic uh, or traditional media on the internet and also the creation of online content. And um, we feel right now, having achieved uh, some pretty substantial gains from seven conglomerates who fight really hard and don't want to give you anything, that we now have contracts for new content on the, on, on the internet. And we feel a little like the, the car that, I mean, the, the dog that chases the car and catches it. And you know, now what do we do? Because we always thought, well, this is, we have to work this out because if we don't work it out now, when the uh, when the business model is there and when the uh, when the, the large corporations have finally figured out how to be the gatekeepers and corner the market in the monopolistic fashion that they traditionally do in all other media's, we won't be able to work our way in. So we have a toehold in new media, and it's become the the, the mantra of the, the the guild to become sort of the center of the many-spoke wheel uh, that's linking our members, professional writers of audiovisual material for some 75 years, with the uh, distributors and marketers of that kind of content. And that's a matter of linking people who have traditionally not been linked because of the involvement, or some would say interference, of studios and networks who control the distribution. Uh, and so our uh, mandate now is to develop uh, relationships between our members and, uh, and not only the audience, but also advertisers and, and aggregators and the like. And, and uh, a few months after the strike had ended, we were approached um, by machinima.com, which is, uh, I think, the number five all-time content provider for YouTube and also uh, a, a, an important destination itself for, for gamers and for um, individuals interested in creating uh, what has to be among the cheapest forms of, of animation in existence. For those of you who don't know what machinima is, the word is made up of machine and cinema. It is designed to be the um, use of video game assets to, to create new content. So in other words, you take the characters and the settings uh, of World of Warcraft and operate them like puppets with your own dialogue and with your own storytelling to create uh, an entirely different um, story. Um, most of the machinima that exists right now, and there are tens of thousands of amateur machinimas um, of varying degrees of quality that, that exist. I was actually at Stanford Law School about a week and a half ago where there was the first ever panel on machinima law. 
because there is now this growing uh, concern about rights and, and uh, uh, within the gaming community. And companies like Microsoft care about what you do with Halo characters, uh, although they take a very George Lucasy kind of approach to it, which is that go ahead, do it. The fanboys out there can can use the content, but you can't make any money off of it. Um, and if you do do something that we like, we own it. So there has to be a different relationship when an entity like Machinima.com comes to professional writers and says, "We like to take the next step. We would like to have." Um, professional comedy writers who've worked on The Simpsons, uh, Family Guy, we have Seinfeld writers, we have Saturday Night Live writers who, who uh, have now, there's 15 of us who are producing television half hour pilots using Machinima, where again the cost is pennies on the dollar to produce what would otherwise be a broadcast television quality pilot. Um, Machinima has also developed the, the relationships with the, the content owners so that in the event that any of these properties incubate online and become uh, properties for TV, broadcast, or cable, or go to DVD, or a, a place where we can actually monetize them, um, that they, uh, you know, they, they don't just shut us down for, for violating their, their uh, intellectual property rights. Um, and that's actually only one aspect of it as far as the, you know, the gaming community, and I've been to enough of the panels today to know that there are, there's a real interest um, among a certain portion of you know, the, what's, what we sometimes call the third screen, namely the, the internet screen, has actually become the first screen for people who do absolutely everything uh, online, whether it be entertainment, news, information, games, etc. And so there's this pre-existing world of gamers out there who use Machinima already and are familiar with not only the characters but the techniques that we can have a built-in audience who will watch this content and then well, the, the, the premise is we would then go to a network or a cable company and say, look, you've got a built-in audience who will then migrate uh, along with the other uh, audience that already exists on that, uh, those channels to watch this kind of content. Um, and then the comedy hijinks ensue, and we all get rich and we all uh, retire to Fiji. That's at least the plan. Um, as, as Glasgow said, I don't have anything to show for it yet, because all we've done is write. We haven't actually uh, produced, because even though it is 10 cents on the dollar, you might recall that global financial meltdown that happened a few years ago and that, a few months ago, and that seems like years ago now, but a few months ago that, that has since sort of slowed down the development process even for really cheap stuff uh, like what we're doing. And so we are still a few weeks or months away from actually showing anything. And I thought maybe I might show one of the classics of Machinima because of course the internet is about taking advantage of other people's ideas and content. Um, so do you think we can Show of uh, unfortunately, our internet hard. connection is, is not working. But, okay. but I'll pitch it out for him. Um, you guys know what Halo is? Okay, it's a Microsoft game where you get on there and you shoot lots of people. And uh, Red versus Blue is a, a really amazing, um, a, a, an amazing body of work at this point, not just piece of yeah, work. Yeah, they've done over a hundred episodes of this of this show. It's Rooster Teeth out of out of Austin, Texas, so the machinima capital of the world right now. Is in, is in Texas, and, and they've managed to put together, the easiest way to describe it is Seinfeld with you know, guys in, in uh, uh, outer space uh, military uniforms, and, and it's all about you know, guys who, and it's, it's genius because there's no lip syncing, they're wearing these masks, but they talk to each other about God and love and war and, and whatever, and it's, uh, it costs them nothing, and they get, you know, millions of hits on YouTube and their own website. And it's, again, it's a, it's a business model that's very, very enviable, as long as Microsoft lets them do it, which uh, they have. I, I believe apparently. Microsoft has started underwriting them. In, in yeah, no, now they're at the point where it, I mean, originally it was designed to be promotional, you know, you guys play with our characters over there while we lure all the guys that are playing the game over here to actually pay for it, but now it's become a, a mutually 
I saw, well, they're having a good time next door. Um, it's, it's become a mutually valuable uh, property. Okay, thanks. Let's talk some more about that in a, in a bit. Um, Aaron, Aaron Simpson, um, the founder of Cold Heart Flash, um, prior to that was the vice president of animation and development at Jib Jab Media, which had some of the monster viral hits that I'm sure a lot of you had emailed to you um, a number of times. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So, so we're going to show a, a little piece of flash animation. Would you like to in, uh, introduce it? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, it's part of this website, Cold Heart Flash, for the last about five years. I've been uh, plumbing the depths of the web, trying to find you know, great work, emblematic of uh, the power of this tool, Flash, that's before that had been known, I guess, as maybe the second cheapest tool to make animation. Um, people just knew it as a sort of like, if you can't afford a cartoon, use Flash. Um, and what I was seeing is people really who knew what they were doing using it. So here we go. This is Nacho Rodriguez, Mr. Koo. Sorry, I'll, oh, I'll sorry. back it up for That's you. Uh, Nacho Rodriguez, Mr. Mr. Koo. Yeah. I did not mean to cut you off. I just loaded it up. You want to keep going? Or? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, that's, there's not much more to it than that. It's, uh, it, it, it won. It won this uh, contest called the Flash Animation 10. Adobe sponsored last summer uh, where I got a panel of judges from all walks of the world, not just Flash Animation. And, and CG, a Pixar director, and a bunch of people really knew what they're talking about from all steps. And they voted this sort of the best Flash Animated short out there. And I think you'll see why it's really fluid. Uh, some of the worst flash animation has this sort of puppet hinged look that's reusing assets over and over. It has its own use in different mediums, but we as animators, you know, Jorge, did, it, with his show on Nickelodeon, uh, you know, really showed that this tool can be like, it's whatever you want. It's, it's, it's only limited by the artists who use it, so, and I think this short uh, proves that, so. Here we go.
Avengers animated movie. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's the story's not, uh, you know, I think it's a retelling of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. Well, nice. thank you. Um, uh, Jorge, uh, down there on the end, Jorge Gutierrez uh, was a creator and EP of El Tigre, a show that uh, ran at the place where I'm working right now, Nickelodeon. Um, and so we're going to show a little bit of that also. Maybe like the first 45 seconds? Okay, cool. You look over at me and go like this. It's just opening credits. Okay, great. And the show is incredible, but we can't show this. Okay. Is, can you get it? These are available on DVD? Can you pick uh, it up? Not in America. Okay. So I'll travel. If you guys go to the BitTorrent sites, you get it for free. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I said you. <laughs> but Nickelodeon's not giving you lots of money for those? If Nickelodeon has a problem, they can call me. I'll take care of it, don't worry. <laughs> okay, we're loading up. Miracle City, a spicy cesspool of crime and villainy. This is the story of Manny Rivera, better known as... character design clients was Mucha Lucha, and uh, that's a, another great look that yeah, mixing yeah. the flavors there. Very cool. Um, all right, now let's argue. Can that model, can this one animator on with this one harebrained idea, creating new shorts every week, releasing them on YouTube, are there a hundred of those? Are there a thousand of those out there? Uh, I don't know, and is that the answer? No. I mean, obviously we still want, you know, LT grays, we still want, you know, things produced by big teams and long story arcs and we want to be moved and we want to cackle for hours but um, it, it's just fascinating to see that model emerge and then th these people are out there uh, not necessarily in Hollywood, typically not in Hollywood, uh, making that type of loot. Pretty, I mean some of the kids that, that have been the YouTube stars uh, that have done really well by it um, have the big Channels have proposed to make shows with them, and they said, no, I'm yeah. cool, man. I'll just stay home and take money baths. Uh, uh, some napkin math, that Fred guy, if anyone knows Fred, this guy, napkin math, he's probably making 50 grand a month. So uh, I'd stay at home. And my, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, so I think one of the challenges that, 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 addresses, that ad addresses creators is, is figuring out how to build those relationships w with the people who paid the money, with sponsors. And um, I, I presume a few of you guys are already kind of starting to break ground in that direction. Patrick, you spoke for a moment about um, <coughs> developing relationships with advertisers, which is traditionally not what the WGAW does, but it seems like it would be great. Well, that's, you know, the trick seems to be there was an old business model that worked for radio, worked for films, worked for, for television, broadcast and cable, where you had big studios, you needed a lot of money to produce even the cheapest television show. You would pay the writer-creator uh, a pretty good salary up front, uh, and then you'd give them a share of the back end. And this is where you know, the Norman Lears of the world, and David Kelly, and, and you know, all these important television uh, names made their living. And, and over on, on this side of, in the future, we have this business model where the, the writer creator is the entrepreneur, has not only the production under his or her control, but also the distribution and the marketing. And the eyeballs come to their show, it's monetized to them, whether it be through an advertising model or a subscription model or a, 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 a pay-per-view, however, that you know, whichever one of those battles and wins, or maybe some of them will win some of the time and others other time. And and what's interesting now is we're in this transitionary phase where 
the big studios that still basically control just about everything we see and hear on TV and radio and in theaters, they, they look at that old model and they look at the new model and they say, well, we like the idea of not paying much money to people up front and they do it for free and they get their friends to do it and sometimes they'll even get a big name to do it for nothing. And then we'll share with them in the back end. And unfortunately, their reputation for doing that sort of thing hasn't been all that good. And so the, the business model that's emerging is a one of writer, creator, entrepreneurship. I mean, what, what I think is so kind of fascinating about it is that that's exactly it. There is no media conglomerate in the middle necessarily. Not between, yet. I mean, I mean I, frankly, I think it's going to be hard. I, well, I, me and all my friends will have an easier time getting jobs if they do figure it out and, and the, the gravy train will start again. Well, but but if they don't, yeah. we'll have to figure it out on our own. No, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with making sure, you know, it, it may end up being a mile wide and an inch deep and the days of, I mean, the days of the $10 million a year development deals in Hollywood are gone anyway for, for, for you and my friends. But uh, it's, it's the, the future where somebody is going to have a breakthrough hit. You know, we've had this thing along with that Seth, uh, Seth MacFarlane's cavalcade of cartoon comedy and, and uh, John Sweden's Dr. Harwell's Sing Along Blog. So basically, The Secret is a really long, possessive name uh, in the title. Uh, once we come up with that kind, you know, what, there will be a breakthrough hit. And as with, you know, unfortunately, the history of art has been about copying other people's art and making you know, your own name that way. And so that, I think, is going to be the, ne the next big thing has yet to happen, but the seeds are being planted every day. Okay, cool. Dave, you were talking about, about looking forward to building your own, making your own movies and stuff it, within the company. What, uh, what are your highest aspirations for that kind of thing? Well, well highest, uh, tough to say, but we, we partner with writers. We make a conscious effort to develop uh, our own ideas. In fact, that was part of the reason we started our own company. Now, we're a step up from what Aaron described in terms of uh, a guy in the garage with a computer. We have a team. We have, uh, y you know, people who are helping us in the creative process. Um, it's a slightly bigger dream at our level, but it's a similar dream. Um, with that said, we still develop pieces that are nothing more than uh, internet fodder. Uh, uh, the, the other day I had uh, shown something we had done two years ago, maybe it was one year ago, of uh, Larry Craig. Um, and it was a very quick clip that we did just for kicks, just to put out there, just to get YouTube hits. Um, you know, being a fairly young company, it is of interest to people we work with that we are hip enough to understand uh, the significance of that development, the, that developing media uh, area. I, I think it illustrates too is what the web can be used for to differentiate or web producers can differentiate themselves from what's going on in Hulu, which uh, you know was in production, you know, I don't know six months prior to uh, the, the initial airing on Hulu, is that you can be reactionary. Obviously, South Park does a daily show; they're doing timely comedy that happened last night, and they've got a riff on it today. But uh, animators and filmmakers, live action doesn't have to be animated. You can react tonight, have it up tomorrow morning and beat you know, Hollywood to the punch. And I think that is one of the big sort of game changers that people have to start embracing is being reactionary uh, and timely. It's, it's sort of like, what can we do better than Hulu? And that, to me, that's a big one that stands out. And I see people doing it, like Larry Craig or whatever you know, happens, who guffaws tomorrow, and who, who you know, says don't go on trains <laughs> next week. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, John Andrews, this is a little off topic from the, from the topic of the animation specifically. But, but we've been talking a lot about new media and how animation is working in that. And I'm interested to hear uh, your thoughts on the 30-second spot business and how, how you work with, with advertisers and clients when that is maybe starting to decline. Yeah, well, uh, putting on first my hat as a VP of a <coughs> production company that does commercials, you know, it's really a tough time. Uh, not only is it a very slow time, uh, A-list directors are taking the C level commercials, you know, just to try to maintain their income. Uh, plus, there's an unbelievable downward pressure on uh, the uh, on budgets, 
uh, which actually the fact that everybody knows that uh, things can be done in a more DIY kind of way, uh, you know, sort of feeds into, and suddenly things that you bid on that might have been 160,000, you know, are now 60,000. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's great that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that the, the market is open to, it's like we're all been pretty slicked out, so the, open, the market is open to things that look, you know, when you have TV shows like The Office and you have things like that, you know, that, that look a little more, you know, and it's not DIY, it's done, you know, in a, in a full on studio setting. But lo-fi, uh, lo-fi. Yeah, there's, because there's an openness to lo-fi, because nobody really is impressed that easily, uh, you know, you, you either got a hundred million dollars for a movie or anything else is, you know, it's fine if you shot it in your bathroom, I guess. But, um, but anyway, so we find we pick up a lot of little projects and, and uh, you know, we, we'll do something for uh, TV for a client and then we'll do six more for the web. And, you know, and of course, uh, for the web, they've got, uh, you know, 5,000 each and, and for TV, they had 100,000 and you're supposed to sort of find a different uh, production model that'll work for that. So, I mean, I think that the, there's a range of opportunities that are new but uh, but um, but the money in the business uh, is at the moment quite a, quite a lot less. Thanks. I'm interested in hearing uh, uh, Jorge, how how you, these guys are talking about are monetizing their, their sites. Is it because they have a site that has a lot of hits and then an advertiser wants in, or is it uh, pay or a pay site? Mm-hmm. Well, you were talking about uh, you know there are people that just it's a guy in a garage and, that, and Oh, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron was talking about. Oh, Aaron. 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 So it was in how they're monetizing? Yeah. It's, I mean, YouTube is the game, and it's the really only game of town. It's the big dance. Um, it, you know, if anyone, you, if you find 10 million people doing anything at one time, there's money to be made there. And some of these people are, you know, doing millions of hits, uh, and you got to hit probably a lot more than that to start making some serious revenue. Um, but that, coupled with a little bit of a syndication around some of the other networks, uh, you know, Daily Motions and all those. It's, so it's a kind of micro payment. It's micro payment. It's not necessarily reason. one advertiser saying, yeah. I want that. It is it's, gotcha. it's sort of the aggregated plan. And it's, and it's a mixture. Some of it is people saying, I want to buy into this micro network on the web. Machinima gets deals where an advertiser just buys that network on YouTube. Uh-huh. They have a massive network on YouTube. Um, and Mondo Media is the, the, other, the other one that's really huge on YouTube. That It's an animated show, Happy Tree Friends, if you've seen it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's the model, whether that's here to stay, I don't know. I, I think one of the things that, that's challenging, and some of these kids, who, which I can say now, I'm going to be 40 pretty soon, um, these damn kids, um, have figured out that, like, in the olden days, we, most of us used to just make stuff. By the way, I just thought you produced my favorite show, and what maybe gave birth to all this, Beavis and Butthead. Um, um, <laughs> I read that bio just now. <laughs> I read it. Um, um, and... Uh, but, but the, the, the number of hats that people have to wear, because we used to just kind of be able to make stuff and then hopefully it went okay and everything was okay. But my friends that, that are doing the YouTube stuff as a business, they, they're spending 15, 20% of their time making media and the other 80% of the time is managing the, all the traffic and the views and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that seems like another challenge that, that we're gonna all have to figure out. It, that business scale is really, Poorly, because if you're still one man band and you want to, you know, suck all the profits out, you also have to in- interact with a million people who want to comment with you and send them T-shirts or, do, you know. Uh, but there, there's a micro business building around creators like this. Um, there's a company Amplifier down in Austin who all, I think they also service uh, Machinima, but they do T-shirt sales and poster sales and calendars and that type of thing for, you know, studios, mini studios that make cartoons or live action shorts. So, because they don't want to be shipping shirts out of their garage, you know, they got a computer in there. So, uh, it's it's about sort of you know building resources around people that aren't you know costing them thousands of dollars a month to keep up. Like so, a network of cottage industries. Cottage, sort of. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. Which is only it's a microcosm of what a company like Walt Disney does. I mean, they they make they spend millions on a feature film, and then they make millions on. Lunchboxes and bed sheets and dolls and action figures, and so instead of spending millions, you're spending dollars, and you're making dollars on on the on the back end. And it's it again at some point it's going to the, some entrepreneur it's going to be redistributed in a way that somebody is going to get more than they than it costs them, and then everybody is going to try to copy that 
and who that is and how how much success any given entity is going to achieve remains really to be seen. Okay. I want to speak quickly to, uh, there seems to be a focus on monetization and uh, there's benefits even if you create something that doesn't get monetized. Um, you know, the staff we have, the, the level to which we're performing uh, is kind of uh, thanks to a lot of people who's put time into learning a, an art uh, and whether they're doing it by themselves and posting on YouTube, um, it, in general, it's changed the face of how people develop as, as artists. Uh, you know, it's been mentioned and kind of cited by Aaron in his clip uh, that, that now flash animation is being used to create stuff that looks like traditionally team animated shows. And uh, that, de that development w was not necessarily just made under a corporate structure. It was made by individual artists who took the time and, you know, without thinking through uh, how am I going to monetize this, but in, instead did it just for the sake of doing it and then posted it just for the sake of being seen. I do think there's benefit to that. Um, I, I, I certainly agree with that, and I'm not looking to, 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 to argue the way Glasgow wants us to, to but I, I, I do think that the the wiki style of production where, you know, everybody out there, anybody can, you know, write, produce, direct, and, and be a star, um, is, is going to have to be supplemented at some point by um, individuals like his members, my members, who have actually, you know, learned the process and developed the art, developed the craft, and, and it may, may be that they learned it the way, you know, on, on, on uh, the projects you were describing, and that's where, you know, film schools have always, or have, have become a, a, you know, an important part of the process, but eventually, you know, if you've got 300 million Americans, each one making their own videos, it's just not going, that, that's not going to be the way that, that even for art's sake, we're going to develop a library of, of of content. I think at some point, you know, you've got whatever, 20 years to make your first film and then you've got a couple of weeks to make your next one. And that, I don't know that everybody has either the time, the energy, or the the financial wherewithal to do that. And and that's, that's what I'm saying, that I think there's going to have to, there's going to be a weeding out of the, the, the com community of, of, well, I'll call wiki production. Interesting. I mean, John, you're speaking a little bit to how, how that, like in the olden days of, of, five, year, of five years ago, um, you, if you, you made like an awesome short or something, it showed at some festivals or was kind of a hit and you get signed to a commercial, direct, commercial place or you get a feature deal or you get a TV show or something like that and it's all awesome. But now there's so many people that are doing stuff that, as you're saying, it's depressing the price of, of the spots. Uh, yeah, and, but uh, the interesting point you brought up, you know, when I was first uh, putting together my team of directors, and, you know, I came from MTV where, you know, I was, in addition to doing series, I was also uh, 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 commissioning things like on your uh, IDs and things like that, so I, I worked with a lot of independent animators. And that was, there used to be a point, point when I would go to places like Annecy in the, in the mid-90s where I'd say, my God, I'm seeing these things that you'll never see anywhere else. And then all of a sudden it was all online. And, and it's a phenomenal uh, change in access, and it completely changed the way I interact with uh, advertising agencies, because I used to go in and uh, do these little sort of luncheons at ad agencies and show work that none of them had seen. You know, they would blow their minds. Wow, that's a cool style. Let's, you know, do that. Now it's much more about them sitting at their desk and, uh, and trolling sites and, you know, luckily, often, you know, clicking on links you send them. So, I mean, there is this kind of direct communication, uh, which is less direct because it's not in person anymore. But... Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the access and exposure, I mean, has, has increased tremendously. And, and I do think that all of us are in this business, you know, first of all, because we either love, uh, you know, making the art or doing the writing or, or uh, you know, I mean, think of, I mean, I grew up in rock bands, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe we dreamed of one day having a record deal, but more it was about four or five people getting together in a room and, and, and creating. Uh, and, but, you know, then it is naturally at some point or another to sort of say, is this a business? You know, early days of TV was people from radio, uh, and I think in the same way, uh, and I agree with you in that, in, in that sense, that there's some 
you know, it shakes out. You know, there were 30 car makers, and then it, and then it was Ford, GM, and Chrysler, and now they're dead. You know, and and uh, or close to. And, and uh, you know, this step we're going to kind of churn through stuff, and some models and some groupings are going to go form. I also think though that just making stuff has become part of culture, and, and it, it's not it's not like oh, I made a short. Everyone just sort of great. I did too. <laughs> uh, you know, it used to be kind of a big deal. I had, you have access to a camera? Wow. I remember I had, I had a stop motion camera when I was 12, and I was like, people freaking out on my street, let's make a short. So, and now it's it's like, you know, so I think um, it, it's become like wearing a button on your jacket, you know, when I was a teen. That was like you pronounce something. Here's a message, hey. And now everyone makes a short and puts it on Facebook and sends it around. So, I don't know, I, I somewhat disagree with what Patrick's saying. I, I think that there, I don't know if there's going to be a weeding out. There probably will be a weeding out of people maybe getting, you know, being impressed by what they see because there's just volume. It's so voluminous. How much, you know, stuff is being uploaded every day. It's become, it's almost too much, right? So what, what do I have time to watch? But I think the Internet's a wonderful filter for showing us what you should watch. It finds you, you know, uh, to some degree. So it, Here's the figure I heard. 15 hours of content is uploaded on YouTube every minute. And that's a back-breaking amount of content. And, and they're also paying for our fund because it's obviously not making any money. So who's going to pay for that fund down the road? Um, they're losing you know, a penny every millisecond at that rate. So it's uh, at some point that that will break. And I don't know who's going to fund it. No, I mean, at some point YouTube just won't be able to do that, won't be interested in doing that storage anymore. And they're going to be redirecting. They're already doing this in terms of, of the, the, the partnerships that they have with the higher, the premier content. And fil filtering your way through the noise, as it were, is going to be the challenge that, that, that every artist has, whether you're you know, growing chalk drawings on the, on, the, on the street or, or, or making, uh, making video. Thanks. You know, we're, we're moving in on not much time left, so uh, uh, we'd love to hear some questions from the audience. Yeah, I, I just wanted to know if any of you or any independent company is not part of the studio system to actually do animation work on It's a good match for our company, but it sounds it sounds interesting. Uh, it sounds like somebody might want to recruit animators through some organization that is anti-war or something, so that their own uh, fan base. You know, nobody's anti-war. Oh. <laughs> 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 If you're passionate about a project or it, you know, anything for that matter, you just have to 
knock on a lot of doors, talk to a lot of people, and you might be surprised that it could, it could happen tomorrow. It could take a while, but it's a lot of it is just getting into those areas where they're like, hopefully like-minded people. You just never know. Yeah. Pixar. And five. <laughs> but then DreamWorks is like the same. You're talking about like overnight or in a week. How come there's such a big disparity between the two different worlds? I mean, I have some. I have a comment on that. Um, part of the reason is that when you're a kid or a young person or someone who's doing it for the, in their free time, it's you can devote all your passion for. 48 hours straight without going to sleep or spread out over two weeks or even spread out over four weeks and make something that's really awesome that's a minute and a half long, maybe, if you work really hard. But to make something that's 90 minutes long, you have to be bankrolled if you're by yourself to work literally for, for years. Um, and so that's the reason that only these big companies have so far put out the feature-length films. But I think... I, I I think it would be really exciting to see five or six people decide they're going to do it. And in fact, I recently saw one. Uh, see us Sings the Blues yeah, uh, by yeah. Nina Paley. She one won person. Best Animated Feature at Annecy this year. She, she animated almost entirely herself. Awesome. So not that you're going to try and draw, I know, but it is possible. Technology's helped, um, you know, turn one person into 30. It really, it's not a, it's not hyperbole. There's, it's technology's allowed people to work incredibly fast and be resourceful and also if they break down and can't do it all themselves, they can reach out over the web and get people to animate for them and they've never met, you know. The Boing Boing, that website, boingboing.net, um, recently showcased a, a movie made entirely in After Effects by like, I don't know, four or five people just horsing around and it's feature length. It's crazy looking, but it's cool. I, I love when anybody does something like that. And it, it's like live action. Like, I don't know, like Cassavetti's film that took a week to make versus an animate that took three yeah. years. Like, I mean, it's the difference between making a rocket ship and a paper airplane. They, they might fly for the same length of time, but uh, well, the rocket ship will probably last longer. But but it's just a, it's what you put into it versus what you the charm level that you're going to get out of it. And I, I think too, all, those of us who are animation uh, professionals, when we see the latest DreamWorks or, or the Pixar film, we have no doubt of why it took so much time or money because it's on the screen. I mean, these are phenomenal. about story. The Simpsons is writing its Christmas episode right now because that's when they have to write it. And it takes that much time and, and person power to, to, to do that kind of work, which is why it's amazing that animation on the, the web is actually the go-to place for topical humor. That, that's never been the case with, with television animation. You, you write a joke today about the swine flu, when it comes out, you know, it's ancient history. Well, South Park is the rare exception because they just, they do it all literally in camera. I mean, they do it all, um, I mean, they, they use those techniques that are faster than flesh. Anyone else?
Well, then, I think we have to wrap it up here. Uh, someone else wants our conference room. Um, so thanks very much to Thomas Riegler uh, for organizing this and to all our panelists for everything they brought to it. And thanks to you for coming. <laughs>